our first topic this Thursday on CNN 10, antibodies. What they are, how they work, and what they have to do with coronavirus. I'm Carl Azus. Thank you for watching. The American Red Cross is a humanitarian group that helps people in times of emergency or disaster. It recently told CNN that in the first week of March, 20% of the blood donations it received from people who had not gotten a coronavirus vaccine showed they still had antibodies to the disease. What does that mean? The short answer is that they've probably been infected with COVID at some point, whether they had symptoms or not. The percentage of Red Cross blood donations that had antibodies present has steadily increased since last summer as more people have gotten and recovered from coronavirus. An advisor to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control says blood donors are not a random sample of the population. So this 20% figure isn't a strict scientific study, but it does reflect the disease's spread in America. For its part, the CDC estimates that by the end of 2020, more than a quarter of the U.S. population had been infected. It's hard to know exactly because at least 40% of people with COVID may have no symptoms and may not get tested. Those who have been exposed can develop natural antibodies to protect them against the disease. What's not known is how long these antibodies work and if they can keep people from getting different variants or strains of COVID. This is similar to what doctors say about vaccines, that people who get them are protected against coronavirus, but how long and whether this protects them from new strains, that's still unknown. In all cases, though, our antibodies may play a role. One of the ways our immune system protects us from viruses is through antibodies. Antibodies are proteins in our blood that attach themselves to parts of viruses. That limits the infection and also alerts white blood cells to come in, attack, and eliminate the virus. So in many cases, if the body encounters the same virus again, the immune system has leftover antibodies that are taught and remember the previous infection. These cells can either fight off the deadly virus directly, or they can produce more antibodies to help prevent the infection. Researchers aren't entirely sure why this process works so well for some viruses, but not others. Our immune system seems to remember some viruses better than others. A person is generally protected for life after one encounter with viruses like chickenpox or polio. However, there are some viruses that our immune systems seem to easily forget. Scientists have reported that immunity could be short-lived after encounters with some common seasonal coronaviruses, which can cause the common cold. That could help explain why we can repeatedly get sick with something as simple as a cold, even if we think we've been exposed to cold viruses before. We could be getting exposed to new strains as well. And some viruses like the flu can mutate often, which means our old antibodies no longer work against new strains. While most experts do believe that we're probably gonna have some protection after being infected with the coronavirus, we're still not sure just how long that protection will be or how strong. Trivia. The scientist Dr. Ted Fujita became best known for his research into what? Volcanoes, hurricanes, tornadoes, or earthquakes? Fujita is the namesake of the Enhanced Fujita Scale, which characterizes the intensity of tornadoes. Parts of the American South were under tornado watches or warnings on Wednesday. Roughly 50 million people were in the path of severe storms, and the U.S. Storm Prediction Center, a government agency that's part of the National Weather Service, issued its highest risk level for severe storms and tornadoes. It hasn't done that since 2019, when the central U.S. was hit with dozens of twisters. The worst of Wednesday's storms appeared to be headed for Mississippi and Alabama last night. What that means is that strong tornadoes that stay on the ground, potentially causing more destruction, were possible. Alabama's governor issued a state of emergency on Tuesday out of an abundance of caution. CNN 10 contributor Tyler Malden explains why more rough weather could be ahead this spring. La Nina can make this year's tornado season extra feisty, Carl. A La Nina is when the ocean temperatures in the east central Pacific are cooler than normal. It affects the world's weather patterns by altering the jet stream. In the United States, strong temperature differences tend to develop between hot, humid air in the south and cooler, drier air to the north. This contrast causes the jet stream to speed up, and a faster jet stream spells more severe weather outbreaks. These ingredients are in place for this year's tornado season. Though tornadoes can form any time of the year, we see the most tornadoes during meteorological spring, which runs from March 
through May and is known as tornado season. Unfortunately, this year's ingredients are comparable to the record-setting 2011 season. 2011 was the costliest tornado season ever and deadliest in a century. It featured more than 2,000 tornadoes, 900 took place during the month of April, more than 200 were spawned during the deadly April 27th outbreak, the most tornadoes to form on a single day, and 2011 also spawned the infamous Joplin, Missouri tornado that caused $3 billion in damage, the most ever by a single tornado. Storm anxiety is very real. Understanding some key terms and preparing in advance can help ease those fears. Understand the difference between a watch and a warning. A watch means conditions are favorable for development. You simply need to keep an eye out for the weather to potentially turn bad. A warning means there's an imminent emergency and you need to seek shelter immediately. The weather has turned bad. Go ahead and identify your safe place in case you're placed under a warning. Download your favorite weather app and double check that your emergency notifications are turned on so you're alerted as soon as a warning is issued. If you can grab something sturdy to cover yourself while sheltered, do so. It could prevent injuries if there's flying debris. A new discovery has been made near the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. This is a large landlocked lake between Israel and Jordan, and there are at least 11 caves in the region where ancient biblical texts called the Dead Sea Scrolls have been found. In 1947, a shepherd boy discovered the first of these manuscripts by accident. The most recent finding contains fragments from the books of the biblical prophets Zechariah and Nahum. It's the most amazing thing I encountered, I, I found, I've seen in my life. In these remote caves near the Dead Sea, Israeli researchers found dozens of fragments of a Dead Sea scroll bearing biblical text. Written in Greek and dating back nearly 2,000 years, these new pieces of a biblical book have been unearthed for the first time in over 60 years. What we found is new parts of the puzzle of this uh, rather large manuscript. Um, the manuscript is of a translation into Greek of the uh, 12 minor prophets um, from, the, from the Bible. Archaeologists have been working in these caves and cliffs of the Judean desert since 2017 to prevent the looting of antiquities. A survey in this scale was never conducted in the Judean desert. We surveyed more than 100 kilometers of the cliffs of uh, the Judean desert and you can see the results. More historic elements were found. A 6,000-year-old skeleton of a child, rare coins, and a complete basket, thought to be the biggest and oldest intact basket in the world. We're looking at a basket which is about 10,500 years old, and it's kind of huge. It's, it contains about between 90 to 100 liters, and it's a whole intact. Centuries of a hot and dry climate means this basket, made from plant material, may yield new information on how products were stored before pottery was invented. From just a few millimeters to a thumbnail in size, these fragments may look small, but experts say they could provide a huge insight into the history before and after the time of Jesus. Hadass Gold, CNN, Jerusalem. At first, this almost looks like an impressionist painting of the beach, the kind of art you'd see in a coastal condominium. But this is a motion picture of a beach that is frozen. The scene is a Gunquit Beach in southwestern Maine. The man who recently recorded it said it was 12 degrees Fahrenheit outside at the time. That is not including wind chill. Salt water has to be about 28 degrees to freeze. It has a lower freezing temperature than fresh water, so that gives you a sense of how cold it had to get to turn waves into icy ridges. Oh sure, the video makes waves and is really ice to look at, and you probably wouldn't get a sunburn with all that ice, ice, baby, but no one ever says, jump on in, the water's freezing, and that is a deceptive way to sell ices at the beach, so I'll hold off until the surf and the temperature are both back up. I'm Carl Azus. Evergreen High School gets today's shout out. It is located on the West Coast in Vancouver, Washington. Thanks for taking 10 for CNN 10. <laughs>